Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 350 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday t-shirt for answering this trivia question. Friday is National Donut Day. What is the most popular donut? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, um, I just want to remind everyone that if you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can watch them on our website, webinarwednesday.live, and still receive your continuing education credit as well. Also, just to let you know that the scheduled MD Expert Irvine has been replaced with three smaller regional HTM mixers. We understand that the COVID-19 pandemic poses unique challenges for everyone, and we're committed to doing our part in restoring conferences to the HTM community. We also understand that participants may be hesitant or unable to travel, so providing local regional conferences will be able to provide valuable continuing education, networking, and obviously vendor engagement opportunities in a slightly modified, smaller, shorter duration, less crowded, and safer environment. So please join us in Colorado, August the 19th and 20th, Wisconsin in October 1st and 2nd, and California, December 9th and 10th. For more information, visit htmmixer.com. Okay, let's see who our winner of our webinar t-shirt is, and it is uh, Scott Gillett. Congratulations, Scott. The correct answer is glazed donuts, closely followed by Boston cream, yum. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Nuvolo. Nuvolo helps companies better manage enterprise assets using modern, mobile, real-time reporting and an industry-leading cloud-based platform. Visit nuvolo.com for more information. Our presenters today are Matt Bertich, President of Bertich Engineering, and Carol Davis-Smith, President of Carol Davis-Smith & Associates. Carol, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thanks, Linda. Matt, let's uh, move forward in the deck, please, sir. So um, again, just like to thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, so let's start with what is it we're going to talk about? Um, I think uh, as the title says, we want to try to help you manage risk more effectively. Um, and hopefully as a community, we can manage it more effectively together in a, a more consistent manner. So probably the best place to start is at the beginning. Um, we'll take a few minutes just to talk about and make sure that we uh, all level set and, and start out on this journey with a consistent understanding of what is risk and, and how do we quantify that. Matt then will take us through some history, um, how risk scoring has played out in our HTM community. Um, he'll then also um, illustrate the, uh, the points uh, more uh, in a more detailed way by using AEM as a, as a timely example. And then I'll try to wrap up our, our time together with a few more examples of how this consistent understanding of what is risk and how do we quantify it is used um, throughout the healthcare industry and not just within uh, the HTM community. So with that, let's get started. All right, so what is risk? It is universally understood as a potential, risk is a, um, the, uh, the potential for something bad or something adverse to happen. Now, when we wanna quantify that, uh, we also have universally understood. And when I say universally understood, I'm not talking about just HTM or just healthcare, but across all industries, we talk about risk as the potential for something adverse to happen, and then we score it or we quantify it by considering both the severity and the probability of that adverse event occurring. You may often hear in the, uh, you may also hear um, in the in the literature or as people describe this and talk about this, you may also hear them use the words uh, consequences or impact rather than severity. These would all be synonymous in, in, the, in the conversation about risk. Similarly, you may hear uh, references to likelihood um, as opposed to probability. Again, um, in the case of this conversation, these are synonyms, if you will, as we go through. Um, and on this slide, just a couple of examples. I'm sure many of you have seen these sort of charts. Um, I personally like to refer to them as heat maps 
um, because in this representation, and, and Matt will talk more about this, in this representation, we use the idea of uh, the, the red, yellow, green to focus our attention on the higher probabilities and the higher severities or higher impacts uh, or consequences that are associated again with risk. Let's go to the next slide, Matt. So to sort of reinforce the fact that this is um, universally understood, I'll, I'll point you to uh, a document that that doc, that, that uh, the documents um, the concept of risk. Oh, let's go back one, Matt. There we go. Um, this particular document from ANSI, Amy, and ISO um, speaks to the application of risk management in medical devices from the manufacturer's perspective, so from design uh, and manufacturing. However, what you will see in terms of the definitions um, and the concepts, uh, it is just as applicable to the entire life cycle of, of medical devices. So this really gives us as the HTM community a cornerstone document to continue to pick up where the manufacturer leaves off and continue in a consistent manner of managing, identifying and managing risk throughout. So as you'll see in this quote here, um, the document, as I said in the, in the prior slide, has two components, the probability and the consequences or severity of an adverse or something bad happening. Next slide, please. Now, the same document has a lot of uh, additional definitions that you may find helpful. I'm not going to read through all of these at this point, um, but suffice it to say that this document is a great resource, um, and, and there's uh, uh, assistance on these on these slides for you to, to acquire it and, and read it further. But I think even just on this slide, becoming familiar with these universally accepted definitions um, of risk and, and associated measures, you know, harm, severity, um, the estimation, and, and then the, the management is important for us as the HTM community um, to set standards within ourselves and consistency amongst ourselves um, to risk uh, the medical devices that we are, or risk score the medical devices for which we are um, responsible. But also being able to say it's it's based in um, uh, consensus, if you will, through this uh, standards document uh, that gives us sort of that stick in the ground to uh, anchor our thinking and our own strategies and our own organizations. Matt, if you could go to the, the the next slide, please. Sometimes this is a little easier to um, envision if we think about it as a process. Um, and this is a process I'm going to bet that every one of you is familiar with, but maybe hasn't thought about formally, right? Um, we do risk analysis. That is, we identify on a, a routine basis. Whenever a new piece of equipment comes into our organization, we think about what are the risks associated with this device? The risk um, to me as the, the service provider, to the clinician, uh, as the caregiver, to the patient who's receiving diagnosis or, or, or treatment, uh, via this medical device, we that's a, a routine activity that, that we're all very familiar with. It's the next one that, that trips us up sometimes, and it's that risk evaluation. This is the second step of risk management, and it's um, the one where we need to then look at what is the severity of those potential harm events or those potential adverse events, and what's the probability of them occurring. Um, do, is, it, is it likely that they will occur on a frequent basis, or is this something that's very unlikely to occur? Um, is this something that um, creates an inconvenience, that would be the impact or the severity, or is this something that uh, could be terribly unfortunate and result in injury or death? And then crossing those two, as we saw in the previous, like I like to call them the heat maps, um, to understand those things that will happen frequently and have a severe um, uh, or, or, or what level of severity of impact is important to the third step, which is putting controls in place. Um, and by controls, these might be physical things um, that, that minimize or, um, the, the potential or the, the probability of the, of the adverse event, um, or they may be um, things that are policy, 
uh, that, that minimize perhaps the impact. Um, and then, like our, our colleagues in the manufacturing, we have to continue to monitor that. Um, and this is where we use analytics, if you will, to monitor are those um, risks still, uh, are, are the risks still there? Is the severity, has it changed? Has the probability changed? Are my controls, are the things I put in place physically or in policy or procedure or process, are they helping to continue to contain that risk in an acceptable range? So that's the foundational conversation. I want to turn it over to Matt now to talk about the history uh, of risk and risk scoring and how it's played out in our community of uh, the HTM world. Great, thanks, Carol. Uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time digging into these next slides because number one, they're going to be a lot of it will be familiar, but number two, I'm really we, we really want to leave time at the end of this hour for questions and comments and discussion because uh, it, it, these are all issues that are close to what we do every day. And so I'm expecting there are uh, plenty of opinions about, uh, about these matters. And the big takeaway from this history section is uh, not just the history, even though I find that really interesting, but it is to show that the way we have talked about risk in the HTM world is not very consistent with the way the rest of the world talks about uh, risk. And that's the outline that Carol just went through, what the standard way of thinking about this is in all kinds of different disciplines as well as ours. So we'll see how those can come together and, and have increasingly started to come together in HTM practice. Just some little bit of background here. Joint Commission, now we know all about environment of care as the area, the section, the chapter that we work under in the standards. But it really goes back, and we'll see how many old timers there are on the call. Uh, it used originally was called functional safety and sanitation. And then for a spell, it was PTSM, plant technology and safety management. So I'm going to take you back to the days of PTSM. And about 30 years ago, Joint Commission made a change. Uh, it, it prior to that, essentially said all medical equipment gets inspected every six months, period. And they made a change in 1989 into 1990 saying, well, maybe we don't have to do that. Maybe we have some room to tailor particular, particularly our PM activities to what's uh, most important in our work. So many of us have heard about the Fenico and Smith model. And uh, this is one not only are we familiar with, it's built into some CMMS software. It's uh, widely uh, cited. Uh, and been around for 30 years and in its day it was terrific because we all said those of us who were around 30 years ago in the field said okay joint commission changed the rules what do we do now so uh, Larry Fenico and uh, his uh, one of his interns Bridget Smith put together a guide that uh, was published by the Joint Commission in their PTSM series, uh, and it became the standard way going forward. So I want to just list quickly what the different factors are. There's um, a factor called equipment function, and you give it a score from life support at the top, give that 10 points on down through a number of different levels, uh, of uh, how the equipment is used. So you get a score from, I think, two to 10. There's a factor called physical risks associated with the clinical application, and that's a five-point scale. It uh, actually has half as much weight, if you will. But it said if um, this thing could kill somebody, you give it a five, and then you work on down to lower scores. And then there's a question called maintenance requirements, and you can it goes from extensive five points on down to not so much. Uh, and so, interesting. Keep in mind, 
we are not using this so much to tell us how to do maintenance. It's more we put our understanding of maintenance requirements in to this algorithm. And the way it works is this. You add up those three numbers and you get a number that ranges up to 20. And they call that the EM, Equipment Management, number. And in the article, Fenico and Smith, it said if EM is greater than or equal to 12, you include it in the Equipment Management Program. And if it's uh, 11 or less, you don't. So you can see that things have really changed for us now for a number of last few years, Joint Commission, for example, but also the other crediting agents, organizations uh, say that everything's in the man equipment management program. So the question of is it in or not uh, has gone away. And it also, that algorithm, if you look at just the, the required maintenance component of the algorithm it says if it's four or five you do it every six months if it's one to three you do it every 12 months so in other words Fenico Smith was also about determining the PM intervals and of course now and for the last several years we have been required to either follow the manufacturer's recommendations for PM intervals or to develop with documentation and AEM alternative equipment maintenance program that changes it. So the two things that the Fenneco and Smith article would, were put together to do to answer are really not questions anymore. And so my good friend Larry Fenneco was honored as a hero of HTM earlier this year in 25, 24 by 7 magazine and this is a quote I'm not sure when or how the risk modifier became associated with this algorithm. It was originally intended to be just a quantitative method for deciding what should be in your PM program and your equipment control program. So I think what this confirms is if you compare what we just looked at to what Carol introduced at the beginning, this is not about risk. It takes into account to some extent how bad the consequences could be of an equipment failure. Does it, excuse me, does it kill somebody or does it hinder somebody? But it doesn't really take much into account about probability and it's additive rather than multiplication kind of algorithm. Uh, and so it's, it, this is the olden days and it's, I'm here to say, and we can discuss this later. I'm here to say it's time to move on 30 years later. I want to mention one other thing. Following up, and ASHI, the American Society for Healthcare Engineering, put together its own algorithm a few years later that very clearly borrowed from Fenneco and Smith's algorithm. And they had an equipment function and what they called clinical application, but those are scores that are very much like the kinds of things we see in Fenneco Smith. And people, there are still people using, HTM programs still using this algorithm and it's built into some CMMS software. But they added some other factors. They actually said, what's the PM requirement? And uh, there's likelihood of failure and where is it used? And they had this fairly complicated formula where you added these things up and then some division and some more addition and doesn't look very much like the standard process that Carol was describing earlier on, but it put together a, a range. It said, if you have a high enough score, it's so-called priority one, and you do PM twice a year. Priority two, what's the difference between priority one and two? Uh, you should really, really try to do priority one. And if you can get to priority two and maybe get to priority three and lower down, you just do visual checks during annual rounds. And if the number is low enough, you don't put it in the program. Again, it's answering questions that uh, we don't need to answer. Everything's in the program and PM gets done 100%. So, um, Again, something that we've moved past, mostly.
So both CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Joint Commission have a requirement to identify certain types of medical equipment in your inventory. And CMS says you identify critical equipment for which there's a risk of serious injury or death. Joint Commission uses almost an identical definition, but instead of calling it critical equipment, they call it high risk medical equipment. And so adds to the confusion. But both of them, both of these organizations talk about this as risk. And what you'll see when you look at this, now that we've we've had Carol's introduction here, this is only about the consequence, serious injury or death. It doesn't say anything about how likely it is. We could come up with scenarios for almost anything killing somebody. But if the probability is not significant, it's not a, a high risk situation. So I'm going to say that um, both of these definitions are non-standard. They really don't define risk. And it complicates the way we continue to have to talk about uh, risk in our business. At one, these requirements are still here that we have to identify high risk and non high risk medical equipment in the inventory. It used to be that high, some high risk, we had a higher percentage PM completion target and non high risk was lower. Now it's all 100%. There used to be some differences, whether it was an A in an AEM program or an OEM program, that's gone away. Uh, all of which leads to what I think is the world's dumbest standards matrix, which is no matter what, 100% is how much, how, what you should have for a target of on schedule PM completion. So I see CMS and the Joint Commission and the other accrediting organizations sort of hanging on to some older thinking about uh, what they call risk. And what I would say is, not risk in a standard sense that uh, we've been discussing. So how do you do risk scoring? Uh, we use AEM programs for, as an example. And uh, okay, AEM, another CMS versus Joint Commission. CMS says AEM stands for Alternate Equipment Management. Joint Commission says it stands for Alternative Equipment Maintenance. And um, three word phrase with two words of disagreement sets the stage for some of the confusion that we've been dealing with. I uh, just so um, nobody thinks I never say anything good about Joint Commission is I think that the second the Joint Commission's definition makes a lot more sense. Uh, those who wanna know more about AEM programs can take a look at this document from Amy. Uh, you know, ask yourself, do you have an AEM program? And then the next question is, is if you don't, why not? And surveyors are going to start to ask the same thing. If you're not doing some kind of AEM, you're probably leaving money on the table and wasting some time. So this is a call to action to get into doing an AEM program. So use some examples, quick definitions. When I say PM, I mean, planned maintenance, the different accrediting organizations divide that into two things. PM activity is what we do. PM frequency is when we do it. So your PM procedure is probably, you know, half a dozen steps that describe some activity, like set the defibrillator to 200 joules and make sure it produces 200 joules, whatever the activity is. There's a series of those. And then there's a frequency about when we do it. A lot of things we, of course, uh, schedule by calendar, but in the accrediting organization world, if uh, things like uh, overhauling ventilators after a certain number of run hours, uh, that falls under the heading of frequency. So what we do and when we do that on some kind of planned and regular basis. So a PM procedure that follows 
what the manufacturer recommends, I'm going to calling a PMOEM. That's the second bullet. And if we've put in place an AEM procedure, I call it PMAEM in the third bullet. I want to quote from one part of Joint Commission Standards. This is from the Hospital Accreditation Program, HAP. And there's the standard and the element of performance. And it says that the hospital has a qualified individual, uses written criteria to decide if it's safe to put something into an AEM program. And examples of what Joint Commission says are some written criteria include some things here which make sense like the third bullet makes a difference what the maintenance requirements are so this is pretty good straightforward kind of stuff and then there are two examples that i want to dwell on slightly longer both of them use the red words red highlighted words seriousness and prevalence of harm seriousness and prevalence of harm and those are a lot like the terms that Carol introduced, and it's really like cons seriousness is consequence or severity, prevalence is like probability or likelihood, and I take this as a gold-plated engraved in, uh, invitation for us to use standard terminology for assessing risk, taking into account both of those factors and putting them together. So. When you do a risk assessment, you can do that at the level of a whole piece of equipment. For example, we could ask, which is higher risk, otoscope ophthalmoscope or an infusion pump? We'd probably say infusion pump is higher. Why is that? Otoscope ophthalmoscope doesn't break very often, so probability is low. And if it does break, it's no big deal. It's typically the lamp doesn't work and the consequence is the uh, person who needed that otoscope just goes over and borrows the one next door and gets somebody to come up and put a new bulb in it. So when you take probability and severity together, that is down in the green corner of the heat map. And so that's a low risk device. Infusion pump, not so much. We know that the consequence of an infusion pump failure can be quite severe, uh, particularly if, you're, uh, if there's a patient depends on the, the medication or if it's a high risk medication that uh, hazardous medication that you wanna make sure the infusion rate is exactly right. And I imagine your experience is that infusion pumps break fairly often. And so uh, that puts them up in the middle range, maybe on the heat map of the equipment of, of risk. But as soon as we start thinking along those lines, we look at we get into some other question. For example, you really have if you're talking about infusion pumps, it depends on what kind of failure mode you're talking about. For example. Battery failures happen quite a lot. If you don't have a good battery replacement program, batteries are problematic for infusion pumps. And uh, so that's fairly high probability, uh, but they, um, and the consequences could be severe if you're relying on the infusion pump uh, when the, the pump is mobile, when the patient is moving. So you want to think about that. And then you get into risk mitigation and say, how can I reduce the probability? Well, maybe I replace the battery more often. Uh, consequence, you make sure that, uh, um, that your maintenance program is going to make the device more reliable. So my point really is just this. You have to think about the battery failure mode maybe a little different. So you might say, what's what's the risk of an inaccurate flow rate as a failure mode? Well, that's a pretty high consequence if that happens, depending on the medication you're using. Modern pumps don't fail that way all that often. Uh, 
in my experience. Your experience may differ. You will have data in your CMMS to answer that question about probability. But if you, you, you would think about the question of inaccurate flow rate probably a little differently than you would with battery failure. And I threw in one other option down there about failure mode. So upstream occlusion pressure sensor uh, that does things like tells you tells the user when the bag runs out and you got to put some more, uh, you got to rehang an, another bag. Those are pretty reliable. And the consequence is, you know, I don't know, medium, medium, low. I don't know. You can decide what that is. But here's one other factor to consider. For We know that there's one particular model of infusion pumps that had a chronic problem with failure of upstream and also downstream occlusion pressure sensors. And so by knowing that, we probably wanted to take into account that for that model, the probability of a failure is quite a bit higher than it would be for some other model that doesn't have that problem. So I just want to give you the, the idea that you can also do this risk assessment at different levels of analysis, not just at the whole device, but for different failure modes. And one more thing that you can do, another level of analysis, is to look at your procedures, your individual PM activities, the things that you do and when you do them. So if I'm deciding, I'm uh, thinking about flow rate testing for an infusion pump, and I'm thinking maybe I wanna back off from that. I've got good data in my repair records and my PM records that say I can back off. A way you could back off would be I uh, maybe want to do it less often than the OEM says. That's a possibility. I don't know if it's a good idea. Your data will tell you, but it's a possibility. You could decide you want to test at fewer settings. If the OEM says check it at three different infusion rates, you may say, you know, maybe checking at one or two instead of three is good enough. Again, your data can tell you that. Or you could say, as some people do, um, I don't test flow rate because my pumps are really reliable or they break enough that they're always in the shop anyway, so I don't have to go look for them for PM, whatever. So I don't know if any of these are good ideas, but you can ask the question in terms of risk and say, suppose I do test at a lower, at fewer, infusion rate settings. What's the risk of that? It's going, what is what are the consequences of doing that? What are the uh, probability that that's going to create a problem? So you can, I guess I'm making a pitch here for saying, bring this kind of thinking to all kinds of, uh, of questions that you ask around PM and particularly around your AEM program. Uh, I, I'm going to skip quickly past this rather than read these over. I, I, what I'd like you to take away is the VA National Center for Patient Safety had a document about uh, uh, how to do some of this risk assessment work. And the one I have is dated 2002. So if there's anybody from the VA who knows if there's a newer version and if it's available, that would be great. But the only takeaway I want to, for you for this slide is these are the kinds of things that the VA looks at. This is a good guidance, uh, but you'll notice it's really kind of subjective. Severity rating can be kind of subjective. You have to think how is it a reasonable possibility that a failure of this device will kill somebody? That's a really high severity rating. There's no number that you can put on that. So that's uh, uh, subjective and depends on professional judgment. Uh, and looks like I've got duplicated slides here. So, uh, so a subjective, severity rating is a subjective sort of rating. But probability rating, 
to do your risk assessment, you've got tons of data. You've got failure data in your CMMS software that record every kind of equipment failure because somebody brought it to your shop and said it's broke. And some of them are PM related failures. And here's what I mean by PM related failures. Let me go back. The um, PM related failures are ones that PM can do something about. So here's an example. If there's a failure of the infusion pump and it's because the person using it made a mistake in programming it, it at programming it, you can PM that thing twice a day and that won't solve that problem. So that's a you want to know about that kind of failure and you want to help the organization do better and avoid those kinds of failures, but you don't do it by fixing your PM program. There are some things, however, that are PM related failures and um, those we do want to track separately. So let me give you some examples. I think a lot of us are familiar with the thing called the MTBF, mean time between failures calculation, and many CMMS software packages do this automatically. And there's a typical sort of a equation down there, and it looks at um, the failures of all types. The denominator is the key point I want to point you to. Failures of every kind of type. That gives you an overall mean time between failure statistic. But as I was just saying, you know, there are some PM related failures that we want to track separately. And it means failures that we could have prevented by better PM. For example, if the infusion pump batteries are failing early, let's figure out what to do that with that. Maybe we replace them more often, or I don't know. You can think of lots of examples and probably already are working on that. There are other things that are hidden failures that could have been discovered by better PM. For example, defibrillator, the user doesn't know if the defibrillator output is low, you know, you set it for 200 and it actually only delivers 150. The user is going to say, it didn't work, crank it up. And that's fine. But it still, they may miss the fact that it wasn't just the patient or something else. The defibrillator actually had a fault. And the only people who can tell that are people like us who have knowledge and tools and test equipment that can go and measure defibrillator output. So what we want to do is catch these kinds of failures so we do better PM, meaning we improve our PM program so it catches, reduces these failures and is efficient. I mean, you know, you can't catch them all, but you do a trade-off. Better PM is you can cost effectively do a better job of catching both obvious failures like the battery craps out and latent failures like the electrosurgical units not putting out as much as it should. So if you use some kind of definition like that, it changes that MTBF calculation so that the denominator is not just every kind of failure, it's preventable and detectable failures, in other, P, in other words, PM-related failures. And I'm seeing more and more organizations that are starting to use this kind of a, a calculation as a metric for measuring the effectiveness, the performance of their PM programs. Going into some detail would be another presentation, and maybe we'll do that one. But this is where I want to I, I want to stop at right now at this point and talk about what people are doing to implement some of these risk analysis techniques uh, with regard to PM programs. So one of them, I, I know this is too small to read. I just want to highlight for you some. Um, People are now doing using spreadsheets or other computer readable ways to document as part of their AEM program, they've done some risk assessment. And so what you can see is down in the lower half, there's a thing about probability. And that's a subjective measure of 
uh, uh, excuse me, probability of failure, and you can get that information from your CMMS. You can see there's a calculated mean time between maintenance-related failures. And you can also include your factors about how severe this consequence is. And so you can, you can more or less automate this. I see lots of places have started to do this. On a, it, it, people used to do it on a sheet of paper and write it out. People are now doing it on a spreadsheet so you can collect it. We're also seeing this uh, kind of material, th this kind of process being built in to the CMMS. And so I will give an ex example from uh, Nivolo. Nivolo is the, thankfully, I, I appreciate their sponsorship of this uh, program with Tech Nation, but it goes down here and lets you put in, you can see at the bottom of the screen, bottom right, you can choose the severity that you believe applies to this particular kind of equipment, in this case, anesthesia machines. and the probability you can rate that or it can pull out MTBF kind of data for you and do some of the calculations, not only do some of the calculations automatically, but document it and implement it and roll it out through all of your anesthesia machines. So there are other CMS software packages that can do this. Uh, you might want to see what your CMMS package is capable of uh, doing and how much you can automate and make this a standard part of the way that you go about um, that you go about doing risk assessment and in particular AEM uh, decision making. So I'm going to stop and uh, turn it back to Carol uh, to talk about uh, things other than AEM where we this. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I want to take a minute and, and um, sort of augment uh, what, what Matt has been saying by giving you a few more examples in healthcare where this consistent understanding of risk and risk scoring plays out. So um, I'm confident that there are many of you on the call that are way more familiar with this and have way more uh, hours involved in, in cybersecurity than I do. Um, but it's a great example um, where I have worked with teams that look at what are the consequences um, and severity of, of uh, harm events or cybersecurity events. Um, and the probability of them occurring uh, in an effort to focus cybersecurity um, remediation and mitigation efforts, right? Um, are these um, events going to impact the data, the device, the network itself, or again, is it going to have a direct impact on patients um, or staff uh, and their physical uh, well-being? Um, Seg segueing from there, um, the whole idea of, of the, the healthcare risks associated with patients, um, for decades there have been tools at the bedside used by our clinician partners to patient risk score or risk uh, evaluate each patient um, or like us, not maybe not the individual patient, but maybe a, a cohort of, of similar patients. Um, in terms of the risk events, um, the, the adverse events, harm events, um, changes in clinical um, uh, outcomes and whatnot that are scored, uh, these are used, these risk scores are used to determine treatment protocols, um, and they're also used by um, regulators like CMS uh, to uh, monitor the overall health um, of groups, cohorts of patients um, to um, define uh, reimbursable, um, aka approved uh, clinical treatment protocols. Um, so risk scoring and having a consistent risk score um, at the clinical bedside has been enormously important, um, as I said, for decades. More recently, um, that work has expanded both from the regulatory perspective and the clinical management perspective to look at populations, entire cities, countries, um, and more recently, planets um, of populations to um, understand what impacts 
um, the community health status. Um, and that can be things like viruses, like we're the pandemic we're in the midst of now. It can be social determinants, um, another pandemic that we're in the midst of right now. Um, so again, having that consistent um, definition of what is a risk and how do we evaluate it is critically important. And then bringing it a little closer to home again in terms of our responsibilities as HTM professionals, um, activities that, again, are part of our routine, but perhaps we haven't put the rigor around it or the con consistency of, of, of thought and scoring would be things like natural disasters. We're in the midst of hurricane season, and if you haven't uh, looked at your, your weather app lately, there's one coming right up into the Gulf of Mexico as we speak. So our, our, our colleagues in, in East Texas and all along, all the way around to, to West Florida, I'm sure, are activating their natural disaster, utility interruption, sort of emergency preparedness plans based on their risk assessments of these adverse potential events, the probability of it landing on their shore, uh, and if it does, what is the likely severity of. So you can see this plays out all around us. And for us to be able as HTM professionals to communicate, whether it's to our um, other support service colleagues like IT and facilities or to our clinician partners or to our C-suite, we need to be talking risk in the consistent, universally uh, defined and understood uh, way. So um, at this point, I think, um, Matt, let's, stop and let folks ask questions. Okay, thank you, Carol. We have a few for you. The first one is um, most CMS systems use other risk scoring methods. How would I use this method if my CMS doesn't track risk this way? Uh, so I would say talk to your CMMS vendor uh, and you and see what you can do. Some can be reconfigured to do this. Uh, if you can't with your CMMS, maybe you need to do some of this as uh, you know off offline, so to speak, on some kind of a spreadsheet as part of your, for example, your AEM scoring analysis. Uh, I, th I think the main thing is that what we want to do is start moving forward. In, uh, in in how we think about that and find the best way to do uh, to do some do the documentation and to link into the CMMS. Okay, another question here is: Is there any reason why you want to use one risk scoring method to identify the overall risk of uh, of a device, and another method to determine its risk for AEM eligibility? Uh, I, I wouldn't make a difference. I, you know, I, I think we should just be consistent in talking about uh, talking about risk. Okay, one more about risk. Can risk scoring be used to identify whether a device is high risk or not? Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, keeping in mind that we still have this vestigial requirement from CMS and Joint Commission and the others to say something is high risk or not. Uh, so you do have to do that, but I, I think that the key is to, as you're deciding what you, how you do your PM, the, take into account the risks of what you're doing by making changes. And, and let me say something a little deeper about that. In some sense, we think, you know, the the standard way of thinking about things is the manufacturer's recommendations. A, we look at AEM for some things. I'm more and more a believer that the, the capabilities, the methodologies, the thought processes that we have for AEM programs is how we ought to think about every aspect of PM. We, can, we may decide we're going to stick with the OEM recommendations, but we should think in terms of risk. What are the consequences? What are the probabilities of us making changes? How do we optimize? How do we measure the performance of our, of our PM programs? So I think if you adopt that perspective, risk assessment's just you know, a part of how we think about maintenance. 
in in every sense. Hey Matt and, and Linda, if I could add on to that, at the risk of making this more complicated, um, I would also suggest that we need to think about risk beyond the basement. And, and what I mean by that is, is make sure our perspective is not just about the risk that we perceive from a maintenance perspective, but as we are responsible for a broader and broader continuum of, of care delivery environments, um, the risk for a particular type of equipment may vary. So if we think about uh, Matt's example of the infusion pump, uh, maybe take a little time this afternoon to think about that infusion pump in the different sort of care environments within your organization. Um, is it in an OR? Is it in an emergency room? Is it in an outpatient clinic? Is it in your home health care environment? Are the risks the same in all of those areas? Um, or do they change because of the type of patient or because of the type of care provider um, or the, the environmental conditions around them or whatnot? Um, it, this is not, a, in my opinion, is not a one and done exercise. It does take thought um, and, and it is much more complicated. If we think back to Matt's history lessons, um, we live in a much more complex uh, environment, or at least we understand the complexities of our environments today more so than we did in, in decades past. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Another question here is, what role does MDS2 data provide in determining risk? Oh, well, uh, so that would certainly be a factor when you're thinking about uh, cybersecurity risk. Um, and so and that's an area I'm, I have less experience with, but it's going to, it gives you information about what kind of information uh, the medical device is, uh, recognizes, stores, shares, communicates, networks, and that sort of thing. So if you're trying to say, let's put it back to PM or whatever standard process you use for ma maintaining uh, network connected medical devices, yeah, you'd absolutely want to take into account that. So if it's a device that's not on the network or it's on the network and it doesn't collect anything that's, uh, you know, personally identified information, uh, that sort of thing, then that's, there is a relatively low severity uh, associated with uh, cybersecurity risk for that device. So it absolutely should take into account whatever sources of information you can in doing a risk assessment. So I'll just add on here um, that I have worked with teams where we used those forms to, uh, if you will, jumpstart our, our risk analysis. Um, it's, a, it's a really great, it lays out nicely in a very organized manner, um, the potential risks, you know, the potential adverse bad stuff that can happen. Um, but you are still left with the homework of evaluation to within your organization, within your infrastructure, within your users, um, what is the probability of any of those things happening and what would the severity be uh, should they occur? So yeah, that, it's a great tool to jumpstart when, especially your cybersecurity efforts. So, so a related concept that we didn't have time to talk about today is a thing called failure modes and effects analysis. So we talked about failure modes and how you would do an assessment of a failure mode, how likely and how severe a particular failure mode could be, whether it's cybersecurity or the device doesn't function or it hurts somebody or whatever. But you look at the failure modes and what it does, it helps you identify what's worth worrying about. And so you can focus your attention on the highest risk failure modes or the, uh, it, it, to, use, to extend Carol's example about um, uh, weather conditions. So people on uh, in somewhere in your organization are dealing with a thing called hazard vulnerability analysis. And it's uh, it lists different things like hurricanes and blizzards and 
other things like plane crashes at the airport or pandemic or whatever, there are these different things that could happen and then assesses them for your your area. So for example, Carol's in Phoenix, I'm north of Denver, and the likelihood of a hurricane is really low here. And so it becomes a low risk event because it just doesn't happen. So what we're able to do is say in our hospitals, we don't worry about hurricanes. But if you are in New Orleans, you know that they happen pretty often and they're a really bad thing when they happen. So it surfaces to the top, high risk sorts of things that require our attention. Same sort of thing with medical devices from whatever aspect of safety and effectiveness, it helps us think about what's worth spending time on. Really, that's what underlies AEMs. Why should we why should we go out and see if the otoscope lights up? Uh, they don't need to send somebody expensive around to check those. The person using it is perfectly competent to tell whether the light came on or not. So it helps us to think through and gives us a rationale for deciding, I'm just gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna focus my limited HTM resources, particularly my PM resources, on on stuff that's worth doing. I, I've in my AEM workshops, I've keep saying I never got around to it, but I wanted to make a T-shirt that says "Stop doing stupid stuff." And you know, if we just go by the book, the OEM, we do a lot of stupid stuff. We need some kind of a documented, rational, consistent, standard, recognized way of thinking about things to identify stupid from smart and and do the smart stuff. Okay, that's great, Matt. We're actually coming up to our hour. We've had lots and lots of questions. So Matt and Carol, I will be sending them to you afterwards for you to answer offline. So attendees, if you submitted questions, I will be sending them to Matt and Carol. So look out for the replies. So thank you, Matt and Carol, for a great and very informative webinar. And obviously, thank you again to today's sponsor, Nuvolo. Uh, just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is automated. Service survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your, your certificate immediately. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And for more information about all our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. So thank you once again for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks, Linda. Bye-bye.